2 Thessalonians, um, I know I said last week we were closing that out, but I want to transition into chapter 2 doing something. Chapter 2, if you've read through this letter, you know that Paul begins to talk about the second coming of Christ and specifically that there are rumors and false teaching and maybe fake letters that have been circulating through the church of Thessalonica about the second coming of Jesus having already happened. In other words, they've missed it. It's one of the discouragements that they had in the first letter where they felt like they had missed the day of the Lord, which includes the redemption of the saved and then the what? Judgment of the wicked. So going into chapter 2, I felt like the contrast was contrasting the man of lawlessness or the whole of the world that is wicked, that stands in direct contrast with the glory of Jesus Christ that is righteous. And so in order to get the sense of that, I felt like I wanted to take more time and really focus in on the message of verse 12 of chapter 1. So let us look there at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, starting in verse 5, I'll read down through verse 12, and then I will discuss a few things. This is the evidence of righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering. Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed, because our testimony to you was believed. To this end, we always pray for you, that our God may make you worthy of His calling, and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by His power, so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you, and you in Him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So we want to focus on a specific topic today that's driven home, not only with the first letter, but also on this follow-up letter in this first chapter, introducing this letter to them. And that is the glory of Jesus Christ. I want us to ask the question, what is it that is so glorious about Christ? What is it that is so glorious? If you were to answer that question on paper today, what would you say? And is that that you would answer? Is your answer congruent with Scripture? Does it match? Is Jesus glorious because of something He's done? Is Jesus glorious because of something that He is? Is Jesus glorious because of the way we feel toward Him? Or do we feel these things because He is glorious? A few thoughts. We gather weekly, some of us twice, some of us three times, for the teaching of God's Word. This is good. I believe more of us should gather more often for the teaching of God's Word. After all, it is our spiritual food. It is the food of the substance of our soul. And being food, it satisfies us that we are better in our fellowship. Something else to consider. We either, as we meet and gather and eat, we either grow into Christ in our eating, or we grow obese in our spiritual minds. The difference would be that as we grow in Christ, we grow into maturity, which is evidenced by our love for each other. If we grow spiritually obese, it's an obese fullness for our own glory. Not willing to be equipped, but rather just wanting to be fed. It's much like I've told many people through the years, in the very first day that I preached as a pulpit supply in Newark, California, at First Baptist Church, when I opened my eyes and praying at the end of that service, there was a gentleman standing here to my left. Tears rolling down his face, and I walked down to him, and he says to me, we want you to consider being our pastor. To which I responded, you don't even know my name nor anything about me, you don't want me to be your pastor. That's exactly what I said to him. Oh, yes, we do. I said, no, you want me to preach. 
You don't want me to hold you to that preaching. There's a difference in hearing a sermon from a preacher on the internet or hearing a sermon from some book that you read and being held accountable by a local congregation to the preaching that just came to you. One is preaching, the other, the other is pastoring. Shepherding is guiding, directing, holding, barring, guarding, defending, rebuking, correcting. And all of us, even though we are all sheep, and I may be your figurehead shepherd, we are all shepherds of one another through the Word of God. And those who oversee the assembly, they do so with fear and trepidation that they might not abuse the Word of God, but might, for the joy of the flock, hold fast to truth in prayer in study to see that the church is equipped to do the work of the ministry. Something else to think about as we begin today. When we're through eating to one degree or another to spiritual maturity that it evidences itself through love and fellowship and intimacy and ministry or the other through spiritual obesity is just about us and our knowledge that we get puffed up. And when we're through with those things, when we're through with the feast, we leave. We leave service each week. We leave our gathered time and sometimes we do so without consideration of what we are, or who we are, or more importantly, whose we are. We point our direction in the way of life, and we leave the glorious behind. We leave the sublime that we experience through the Word, through the singing, through prayers. We leave the feel and the movement of what we call God, and we walk out the door and it's over. We shut Him up and we shut Him out. But beloved, the purpose of this gathering is that we are encouraged and strengthened just a little bit more so that we might live just a little bit more out there together and in the world, but not of it, with joy and with power and with purpose. I did not answer the call to the pastorate so that I could be a motivational speaker. I could do that much more lucratively without the Bible. I did not answer the call to pastor so that I could fill my Sunday mornings up with something to do. For if I were not a man of God, I would definitely be at the range. Shooting and enjoying my day. Riding a bike. Lounging on the couch. I did not answer the call to pastor so that I could be esteemed and loved because surely it has not come my way. Some of you might, well, I love you. We're good. We are the minority that love each other, church. We are the minority that love. That's why it is such a wise, powerful display of God when people like us can love each other. I answered the call to pastor because there was nothing else I could do. I tried. I tried to be a part-time preacher and just preach in different places. I tried to just be a good Christian businessman. I tried to just be a full-time student for the rest of my life. But pastoring is not something you just choose and pick. It's something God calls you to. And it is a divine calling that you can't retire from. It is a divine calling that you cannot get over. It is a divine calling that you are willing to lose all that you have for the sake of not your own glory, but at the cost of yourself, for the sake of the joy of those people who stand before you and who come around you. This is why we do what we do. That you might, beloved, grow in the joy of Christ. We've all come here today in pain. We've all come in here with some type of pain, with some type of reason to doubt, with some type of hardship, with some type of anxiety. Every one of us in our minds this very day has frustration. Every one of us has sin in our lives. And every one of us has an excuse as to why we should not be engaged in the body of Christ. Some of us even go as far to not even show up on Sundays because of fatigue. Lord, have mercy. If I were not to show up to anything because of fatigue, you'd never see me. I didn't sleep last night. Who does? But yet there seems to be a misunderstanding of the obligation of the spiritual maturity of each Christian that if this pulpit were empty today and no one knew where I was, you would be infuriated. But I'm under no more obligation than you are to assemble in this place today. Even if I had a salary package of a billion dollars, 
I'm under no other ob- no more obligation than you are to be here today. The people of God are not under obligatory attendance in a building. They're under supernatural, divine influence of a God who has put a love for Himself in their hearts and for each other. And we want to assemble because we've all come here with reasons why we shouldn't. We've all come to this place with enough excuses to wreck our faith. But it precisely, it is precisely these reasons that we are to be invested in each other and intimate with each other. The point of being the body of Christ is that we work in the horrors of life with joy together in power. That's the point. If you're waiting for your life to be free of obstruction and frustration and pain and tension, sorry, too bad. Oh, when I get my sin under control, then I'm going to get invested in the lives of other Christians. Well, hallelujah, you're a hermit for the rest of your life. And hermits don't make good brothers or sisters. The church is something, is not something we attend. We do not attend church. We have never attended church. We gather as the church. The point of the word church means to assemble. So the church doesn't exist until we're all here. The church is the people. The church is the body. It's not some place we get together. It's not a check obligation to please God. It isn't getting our spiritual fix for the week. It's a people who have been saved by God through the person of Jesus Christ and we as a people together reflect the glory of our Redeemer now in this world and eternally forever. It's why God saved us that we may praise His glorious grace forever and reflect the beauty of His nature forever. Worship. Everyone that I speak to on the street my entire life we get to talking about church. And I love to ask the question, why do you attend church? See, that question is wrong. But it's the right question for 99% of people. They attend a place. They are not a people. Why do you attend with those people? Why do you gather there? Because it usually comes after a big dialogue or monologue not a dialogue a big monologue about how awful the church is and how awful the pastor is and how awful the people are and how wicked everything looks and how smelly it is and how ugly it is and how weird it is and by God I just hate it and then I say well why do you go why do you go to those people and then they answer me something like this it's either one of two things here's the first one well, I just, this is my family's church. No, this is your family's building. Because it's got the name of your daddy on the side of the plaque. I see it. It's your family's building. Guess what? God's going to destroy that building. Why else do you come and gather? Oh, so I can worship God. I can worship Jesus. That's the right answer. We ought to worship together. But why? Because that's what we're preparing to do forever. The problem is, if we hate each other, if we're bitter, if we're frustrated, if we unrepentant sin, we can't worship anyone. We can't come in here under false pretenses and say we're doing spiritual things when we're not. We can lie to ourselves, we can lie to each other. We can even lie so much that we believe it. But God knows the truth. We come to worship because it is what is within our hearts. It's what's within our souls. It's why people long for vacation so much. They need to get away from life. They need to go take a break. Friends, you get a vacation every Sunday. And not just a vacation, a fake one. You get a real one. Because you get to gather with the people who are going through the same thing you were going through. And even if we're not experiencing the same difficulties, we are... We are sympathizing with one another because we're the same body. 
And it's not just a break. It is a divine appointment. We reflect the glory of our Redeemer now and eternally. What is it that we truly desire to have in this life? What is it that we're working for? What is it that makes us driven to study and to live and to pray and to put aside fleshly things and to fight the fight of faith and to fight against sin and to run the race of holiness? What is it that engages our hearts and minds and bodies to do such things? What do we want? Who are we most longing to be around every day? What do we, what do we desire more? To be alone or to be with God's people? What makes church appealing to us? I just love Grace Truth Church. I'm so glad I got to church because this church got the gospel right. Are you here because we get the gospel right? I hope not. Because it's not like you'd be anywhere else that got the gospel wrong. So that's like a no-brainer. Are we here this morning together because God has put a love for him, for him and a love for each other in our hearts? Are we committed? See, worship comes corporately to the extent that it is done individually. Satisfaction in Christ. Glory in Christ. This is the ultimate end. This is why we live. This is why God has saved us and kept us in this earth. That we may give glory to Him now in preparation to give glory to Him for Him or to Him forever. So let's ask a few questions in relation to the glory of God. In verse 12 there, it says, so that the name, there's a cause, this is the reason. What is the point? I'm praying that God will, what? Make you worthy of His calling and fulfill every resolve for good and every word of faith by His power. What did we talk about last week? That God, though we are made worthy by Christ alone... For the kingdom of God. That in this life. God then works in us good deeds. To show that we are his people. To give glory to him here. So that we can say what Paul has said. It's not I who live. But Christ who lives within me. Don't praise me. Because I can live without cursing. Don't praise me. Because I can live without murder. Don't praise me. Because I can live without lying. Because in reality in my flesh. I'm a cursing lying murder. And it is Christ who keeps me from these things. And when they happen, guess what? It's my flesh, not Christ. But when righteousness is there, Christ is glorified. Well, today, the end of it, we want to live as a people. And all of these things that God has called us to do, that means every New Testament letter and every command written in the New Testament letters to the church, friends, is for us to follow. And Paul tells us that the will of God is for our sanctification. So it is going to take place in the life of His people because God's will is always done. And when we're praying for each other, remember I said this last week and the week before, sometimes we get discouraged with sin in our lives and sometimes we get discouraged with the lives of others. But beloved, we ought to pray for these people so that God would change them instead of trying to figure out what kind of therapy and frustration and aggravation or worse, avoidance might work. Why? Because when we live this way, the name of the Lord Jesus is glorified in us. And when we live this way, we are glorified in Him. And we know that it happens according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. It is by the mercy of God. But what does it mean when we talk about the glory of God? First, we know that God is glorious. We see all throughout the Old Testament, God is glorious. I mean, God is glorious before the earth had formed. God is glorious before the earth existed. God is glorious before there was anything. God is glorious. God is glorious in creation. God is glorious in being. God is glorious in holiness. God is glorious in majesty and love and power and in justice. God is glorious in Himself. And He is glorious if He had never revealed Himself. He is glorious. When you use that word glorious, what does it mean? What does it mean when I hear? Well, we see glorified. We pray for that. We long for that. We use the word constantly. Do we not know what it means, beloved? What does it mean? What is glorious anyway? 
Well, several definitions. Two are go together. One is how we respond. Glorious is the finest high honor and renown. Mainly because of what someone accomplishes. So God is glorious and is highly renowned and is and is um, honorable and, and worthy of honor because of all that He does. But the second definition of glorious is also fitting of God. Glorious means splendor, beauty, majesty. Even if God had just existed and we look upon Him, He is glorious. Even if God has done nothing and moved in no way to create anyone to behold His glory, He is still infinitely worthy and infinitely glorious to be beheld. He is worth all things. What about being glorified? What does it mean to be glorying in God's glory? Well, here's what it means. Look back up at verse 10. When He comes on that day to be glorified in His saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed. See, that was three weeks ago. We've forgotten it already. Yet Paul is still laying the page here. And what's happening in chapter 2 is he's going to give a grand contrast between the glory of Christ and the glory of sin. Glorying in Christ, glorying in God, means that we recognize His renown, we recognize His honor, we recognize His majesty and His splendor and His beauty, and we take the highest pleasure in it. You see that? So glorying in God is taking pleasure in Him above all things. The highest pleasure that anyone could experience is only truly found in Jesus Christ. Last week I quoted John, Gospel, chapter 17, verse 10, where Jesus says, All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. That's how I closed the service. And I felt so discombobulated that I thought, I've got to finish that thought. In John 17, if you'll go there with me, I want to read the entire chapter. When Jesus had spoken these words, He lifted up His eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Listen. Glorify Your Son that the Son may glorify You. I want you to hear all the times Jesus mentions glory. Since You have given Him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom You have given Him, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. The same glory I had, I want it again. Before there was anything, I was infinitely glorious and I want it back. Verse 6, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they, that they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have, known, have come to know the truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All of mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction, that Scripture might be fulfilled. Judas Iscariot is who he's speaking of. But now I am coming to you that these things I speak, they are not, excuse me, that these and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Verse 14, I have given them your word.
And the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these alone, but also for all those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Verse 22, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. I and them, and you and me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me, and love them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love of which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Now, I've already talked about all of this today in introduction. And I'm not going to exegete that or preach that, but the points that I want to make are found there. This is an illusion, if you will, Second Thessalonians. Paul understood the theology of what it means to glory in Christ and to be glorified in Christ and for Christ to be glorified in us because Paul knew the words of Christ in John 17. Did he have it? No. Did he know it? Yes. How? The Spirit of God gave him all knowledge. And beloved, God is glorious before there was anything to behold it. Jesus Christ was glorious at the coming of as a human being. Jesus is glorious eternally. Before the world began. Jesus is glorious humanly. In the incarnation. He's perfect and true. He's glorious. He's worthy of honor. He's in splendor and beauty. Jesus is glorious obediently. Father, let me do that which you sent me to do. I have accomplished all that I've been sent to do. Get, I've glorified you in obedience. Jesus is glorious reflectively as He reflects the nature of the Father, the face of the Father. And I'll show you how that is explicitly taught in Scripture in just a moment. Not just John 1, not just Hebrews 1, not just Colossians 1 and so on, but all through Scripture, especially in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, it even uses the very language that I just said. Jesus Christ reveals the Father, the exact imprint of His nature. All the fullness of deity was pleased to dwell. He was from the Father and fully from the Father. Jesus is glorious in all of His works, in all of His words, in all of His, uh, all of His being. But He is most glorious in the salvation of God's people. Not that there's a comparison. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, you can turn there if you want to. Paul begins to, I mean, excuse me. Yes, Paul begins to, I was almost saying Moses. He's talking about Moses in chapter 3. Paul begins a comparison of that which was veiled and unable to be seen. In other words, we cannot see God. Moses didn't see God. He saw him veiled. He looked at the tail end of the train of, his, the, of the robe of his glory. He could not see it. But John tells us that God is revealed perfectly and the fullness of the glory of God is revealed in Jesus Christ. Paul writes that to this little irritating church of Corinth. And he tells them after they've straightened up, do not worry about what you cannot see and about what others cannot see. For God is revealed in Jesus Christ. He says that Satan blinds the eyes of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. So therein lies the problem. The greatest joy, eternal life, is knowing you, the one true God, the Son whom you have sent. How do we know God? By knowing the Son whose face perfectly reveals God. That's how we have eternal life. So that God would say to us, Jesus Christ the Son, who is God, would say, I knew you, versus I never knew you. This 
is bad news that Satan blinds the unbelievers. But the good news is glorious. Look, listen to the good news. What's the good news? In verse 6 of that, it says this, But God who said, let light shine out of darkness. The blindness is darkness. Unable, unwilling to see. God who said, let there be light. And there was light. The revelation of His glory to something He has made. That it was beheld and He was seen and He was loved and He was honored and He was glorified. The good news is, the God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Jesus is glorified in salvation most of all because He is glory as a Savior by His people. And this salvation, this good news is the perfect plan of God before there was the world. Beloved, do you know God created the heavens and the earth and the infinite cosmos and the infinite, immeasurable, ineffable attributes of all the solar systems to show the insignificance of all of it in comparison to the glory of Him? The Old Testament says, the heavens declare your glory. But yet in Revelation, we see that they're going to be folded up like a sheet. And they're immeasurable. How is something that displays the glory of God anywhere close to the glory of God in creation? The only thing that can perfectly display the beauty and the infinitely eternal glory of an infinitely eternal God is that there is the God, the Son, that comes and forever shows us the face of this ineffable God. Friends, I like to tell people in our little theological discussions, we think all knowledge and understanding and wisdom and, and all that's going to just pop into our heads when we stand before Jesus Christ. We will have no more questions is true. But friends, we will never stop learning the depths of the glory of Jesus Christ. You hear me say often, you just got to look to Christ. You got to die to yourself. You got to lay down your life. You got to lay down this issue. You got to stop being the God of your circumstances and look at Christ. As Daniel looked at Christ in the lion's den, as Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego looked at Christ in the furnace, as people of Israel looked at God. As those who looked at the serpent, as Jesus would allude to in John 3, and they believed and they lived. They looked to Christ. If I be lifted up, if you believe in me, do you believe in Christ? To believe in Christ is not a cultural thing. It's anti-cultural. It's counterintuitive to the very way of life we live as American citizens. It takes lordship away from us. It takes our, even the way our government is established as many kings. And then we're many kings to our state. Our state, each state is its own mini king and each little state is its mini king. That's what a republic democracy looks like. We have a voice and then our state has a voice and then state governments have a voice and the federal governments have a voice and Jesus as Lord is counterintuitive. Jesus as treasure is counterintuitive to economics. The kingdom of heaven is counterintuitive to the American dream. So when we live and we say that Jesus is truly the only thing that we should see, that we cannot do it, is it because we cannot see it? I want you to listen to me. I can whip you into grief, grieving guilt, and you'll be here. I can manipulate you into hard preaching and break the corner off again. Uh, you know, I fixed it, glazed it. Uh, and and I, can, I can get you to feel like, man, I just got to be involved in the church. I have 25 people mopping in here. If 
I just said it the right way. We could, if we got into a couple of books and learned personal holiness and learned some lordship salvation rules and learned some, uh, some, 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 a lot of little things and I mean, we could hang, we could hang the Ten Commandments on the refrigerator and perfect them. Just like the Pharisees did. And we would look like, we would look like the be all end all of Christianity. They put us on the front of every atheist magazine. We got to stop these people. Because they're living as proof of Jesus Christ. As God. And we could all be lost. Are you able to see Christ? If you can see Christ and He's your treasure, God has opened your eyes to see the good news. And you see the beautiful, glorious, majestic, honorable, awesome, Awful, full of all reality of who God is. And it changes us. It changes us. It changes our affections. It changes our thinking. It changes everything. You know what that's called? The new birth. It's regeneration. When God takes the scales off our eyes, when God removes the power of the enemy to keep us from seeing, and we can see we love Him. Salvation is seeing. And seeing is God's work. Salvation is hearing and believing. And hearing and believing is God's work. This is a powerful, awesome, decreed, divine work of God whereby He takes us who cannot see and He gives us eyes to see. And when we see, we love what we see. And when we can see Jesus for who He is, we see God for who He is, and we love Him with everything that we are, because that's the natural response. That is the, listen, the natural response for being able to see God face to face. The wages of sin is death, inclusive of the ability for God to send Satan to blind unbelievers' eyes so that they can not see, and that is a righteous judgment of God. But the mercy of God is that in His love and kindness, He takes the scales off of those who believe so that they can believe. And that's glorious. It's glorious. Why is the book of James and the book of 1 John and the book of Hebrews chapter 6 and 10 such a problem in so many Christians? Because they just can't imagine that if they just do right that God would throw them in the hell. They can't imagine. They do what's right in our own eyes. Friends, the greatest righteousness that we could muster in our imagination, we could not even fulfill it. And if we could, it would still be wicked. You want to see perfection? We can see it face to face in Jesus Christ. So there is no other glorious opportunity for us to live except in Christ alone. We will not glorify Christ unless we trust in Christ alone. Eight years ago today, I wrote a short little journal entry on my blog and it popped up so I could see it. That's what you were thinking eight years ago. I was trying to forget that. Thanks, Facebook. We cannot have faith in our faith. Faith in the fruit of our faith. Faith in our own righteousness. Faith in our own practices. Faith in our own obedience. We have faith in the one who is faithful. And his name is Jesus Christ. Friends, the gospel is glorious. Jesus is glorified in salvation because it is all of Him. Listen, if it were some of us and some of Him, then we deserve that glory. But the Scripture doesn't say that we are glorified with Christ. It says we're glorified in Him. His glory is given to us. We share in His glory. We bring nothing. Jesus is glorified in all these things. He's glorified in His person. He's glorified in His power. And He's glorified in His people who are the church. Back to our text. To this end, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of His calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by His power 
so that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in Him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus. What does it look like for the church to be glorified? Some things came to my mind as I prepared this week. And every time I think about the church, I always think about Paul's teaching to the Ephesians. And if those of you who were not here during those first few years, I actually have all of those sermons minus about two on the, on the church website. Sadly, I'm missing 26 sermons out of my Hebrew series. I don't know where they went. Oh well, I had to preach it. But I've been going back through some of those sermons for that first year when we were in our living room planting as a church to remind myself of the very thing that I wanted to remind you, some of you who were there, of who we are and why we are. That we are to live and exist by the grace of God. We are one people under Christ. We're no longer aliens, no longer strangers to the promise, no longer lost, but we're alive. And the whole reason that we're alive is that we display the manifold wisdom of God and His absolute glorious gospel. And the outcome of that is we praise Him for His glorious grace. And so that God is glorified in saving a people that do not deserve salvation. God is glorified in condemning a people who do, not, who do deserve condemnation. God is glorified in the praises of those people with whom for us. Uh, who He saves, and God is glorified in the destruction and the angst and the pain of those people who have wrath. And Paul argued that. We saw that a few weeks back. But in this, we need to recognize that our coming together each week is because we've been unblinded. We have light. So we must live, therefore, in the light. Our eyes can see who He is, and we behold His glory, glory as the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. It is the namesake of this fellowship. John 1, 14. We are astonished, and we are in love with Him. We are a glorified people who have received a glorified grace. And because of that, we strive in this life how, by His power, by His mercy, to be a people who reflect His work and His mind and His nature and His glory. Are we living that way, beloved? Does our Christianity stop at the door when we leave? Does our Christianity quit when we're on the job and unbelievers start to ridicule Christian stuff? Does our Christianity halt when anger rises up in us? No. Because our Christ doesn't stop. Our Christ doesn't stop saving us. Our Christ does not stop interceding for us. Our Christ never stops atoning for those for whom He died. He paid our debt and it is paid. And so the worthiness of standing in glory with Christ is not our own, but beloved, oh, how we should be motivated by that reality. The picture of glory, this picture of glorification is the point of life. You hear me? Nothing else. Our future plans, our present realities, our past mistakes are not a point. What are we doing this day to glorify God in Jesus Christ? Are we living in Him? As I've already shown you, the Scripture teaches us in verse 10 of that. We, we see in verse 9 of chapter 1 of 2 Thessalonians that, that they, those who do not believe, will suffer punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and the glory of His might when He comes on that day to be glorified. He comes on that day in order to be glorified in His church, in His saints, and to be marveled at among all who have believed. For those of you who have been with us on Tuesdays, we looked at chapter 8 of 
chapter 8, chapter 8 of Revelation this past Tuesday. And when the seventh seal was open, there was silence in heaven for half an hour. This very moment, and for all of eternity, in heaven has been a glorious song of praise. Never ceasing, never ending. But when Christ returns and brings judgment, we who are the saints will be quiet. And I made the point Tuesday night that the reason that worship stops is because we're struck wordless. When we think we have seen the beauty of all that Christ is and all that He's done in redemption to see the culmination of the finished work of Christ where He takes wickedness and He destroys it and He glorifies His church perfectly, I think it takes us half an hour just to figure out how to open our mouths again. We have to readjust our worship. We've got to readjust our praise from a different perspective. Our worship of Christ is not like a child in a candy bar or a quick ride in the adrenaline of a, of a boat race. Our worship of Christ is not about like when we see our bride walk through the doors of the wedding chapel. Our worship of Christ is not anywhere close to seeing the birth of our children time and time again. Over and over. Our worship of Christ is nowhere near the greatest joy that we can find in this world. Every great joy in this life is nothing in comparison to the beauty of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And when we see and we look and we continue to gaze, we see that the things of this world don't matter anymore. Pain, heartache, stress, work, troubles, physical ailments, mental problems, emotions, relational strife, none of it matters because Christ is so much more glorious than it all. To love Christ and to see Him is to marvel at Him. What is it, beloved, that makes so many professing Christians willing to take a back seat to the assembly of God's people to hear about the glory of His majesty? What is so amazing that would take us from this divine call? Tiredness, fatigue, illness, financial calamity, flat tire, cold weather, sin, May God continue to be merciful toward us and to work in us the desire for every good deed in His power that we might resolve every day to love Him and enjoy Him forever. Starting now. What would keep you? In April of 2002, I said this in a service, a large attended service. I could tell that the time was coming close to the hour because I could see this. And the slick guys, man. Wife her arm around their wife and look at their watch. <laughs> and it struck me wrong as they were leaders in the church, and the church was going through a lot of trials. And we needed prayer, and we needed the Word, and we needed fellowship together. But the roast in the oven, the family gathering, whatever it might be that everybody else had, seemed to be more important. And I just saw right there, and I held my hands out, and I closed my eyes. And we had two rooms to either side where you could go in for counseling that led into a big baptistry and a choir room and all that. And, that. and I said, you know what I think? This is called point in your preaching. It's a bad idea. It's a bad idea. But the point was taken. Do you know what I think? I think some of you claim to love Jesus, but I guarantee you if all of a sudden I got a divine revelation, if it was possible, and Jesus walked into the side door and said, hey y'all, right after service, I'm going to be over here in this room if you want to see me. I said, you know the saddest reality of that? There would not be a line. 
I said, because many of you are ready to leave now. And you say, it's hard to preach to that. I mean, you know. But that is the truth of the world. Beloved, it's not the truth of the church. I'm not saying we don't have things to do. We shouldn't be prompt. We shouldn't have a schedule. Your pastor shouldn't be so verbose. But at the end of all things, what does it matter? How many people got up at 2 in the morning to go shopping? Nothing wrong with going shopping. Don't tell me you can't be at church at 10.30. If you got, what was it you said at breakfast? A $10 crock pot at 3 a.m. I got to go. Save five bucks. It's amazing what we do in the name of desire. Marveling at Christ, the beautiful reality of our hope, face to face. Imagine what that looks like. This is the reality of the kingdom of God come down to us. We see Christ, as I was just saying, and all other things seem to have no value in comparison. Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. And the worker of that field finds the treasure and covers it up and with joy goes and, bear and sells everything that he has that he may buy the field. It didn't say he went and sold some of it. It didn't say he begrudgingly went away and got it because he really wanted the treasure. It says with joy he left and sold everything. The kingdom of heaven is like that. That's a simile. The pearl of great price. We saw it time and time again where people would forsake everything that they were, their very family, so that they could follow after Christ. Christ even calls one man to come and He says, let me go bury my Father. To which Jesus Christ, the God of heaven, says, let the dead bury the dead. The hard sayings of Jesus say that we are not worthy of Him if we put our hands in the plow and turn back. Like Lot's wife. And all of us are in a position to where we start to struggle. How are we going to be this way? You know why we're not this way? I know that's what everybody wants. Give us the outline of how we're going to be this way. We're not looking at Jesus. We're not looking at Christ. We're not looking at Him. We're not thinking about Him. We're not talking to Him. We're not hearing from Him. We're not with Him. He's not with us. In, in reality of our lives and how we live. He's not there. We're mired in our circumstances. We're mired in our job. We're mired in our fatigue. We're mired in our illness. We're mired in our frustrations. We're mired in all of the financial problems we're having. We're mired over and over again. We bog down into these things and we think they're ultimate, but they're really not. What would happen if people really start putting our children on the fire? If we said, if we, said we believe in Jesus Christ. Friends, the churches would be empty. We see Christ and everything else in comparison becomes of no value. We see Christ and some things that are of value only have value through Him. Like what? Like family? Like doctrine? Marriage? Work? Suffering? It means something because of Christ. It means something when we look at Christ. We understand it. It has its place. It has its purpose. God in His divine decrees has purposed these things in life to portray Himself. To reveal Himself. And the plan that He had. Give me an example. Marriage. Ephesians 5. I say, this is, this is a mystery, but I say it, it, it what? It responds to Christ in the church. So God created Adam, and then out of Adam took Eve, and the two became one flesh. These two that were separate now became one. This is a picture of Christ in the church. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, who gave Himself up for her, that she may be without spot or blemish. Kids, why in the world? Children don't matter outside of Christ. It's just a big, colossal waste of time. Teach our children, study hard, work hard, earn a lot of money, and die. And teach your kids to do the same. What is that? That's a horrible existence. I know board games that are more exciting. <laughs> like life. <laughs> Nobody likes that game after like age 12. Monopoly. 
That's not what it's about. Things have value because we understand them through Christ. When we see Christ and His value, we understand that it's the point of life. When we see Christ, we long for the eternal opportunity to see all things pass away. So that we can look at Christ face to face. It may seem very odd to end this sermon with what I'm about to say, but I want you to understand that it makes perfect sense in the context of this text. I want you to say, wait a minute, you told us we're not looking at Christ, how do we look at Christ? I say it every week. Every week. Every week. Listen, follow me around and watch what three hours without the Bible does. You think I'm trying to be special because I carry a Bible with me almost everywhere? No. Because it's like leaving the house without shoes on, without a belt, and your pants are too loose, or, I don't know, in your underwear. I can't. I fall into sin. I fall into the flesh. I have to have God's Word continually. Because when I'm in God's Word, I'm abiding in the vine. I'm abiding with Christ. Christ is with me. I'm being reminded that He's there. It doesn't make Him there. He's here. He's faithful. No, that's just too simple. It doesn't work. Yes, it does. It does. When we're in the Bible, people can spit on us and we pray for them. Blessings. When we're in the Scriptures, our children can rebel right in front of us and stick their tongues out and we're like, I should murder you, but Lord have mercy. (laughs) What about God's holiness? Isn't that worth glorying in? God's justice and His righteousness is one and the same. The church is a picture of God's justice because God poured His justice out on Christ that we might be redeemed. The condemned are a picture of God's justice because they will receive their just justice. We are all guilty. Christ has suffered in our place. Thus God is just in forgiving us. His judgment is true. He has declared us just before Him because He has condemned the just one in our stay. And because of this, beloved, we are worthy of His kingdom. And we're worthy of His kingdom because we are like the King. And as we live in this world, waiting for that day, when we take our place in that kingdom forever, glorified, immutable, never sinning, can you imagine what it's going to be like to never, ever have a sinful thought again? Makes my head want to blow up. Until then, by His grace, we are revealing our worthiness in Christ Jesus this present day. Why? To the praise of His glorious grace. And church, it is my prayer before I ever met any of you, before I even moved to this state. My desire was to see us be a people of this type. A people for His glory by His grace. I thought it was so creative. About 50 books by my time. That's what Scripture teaches. I want you to think about that every day. Every time together. Every moment you pray. Not just for your own spiritual walk and your own maturity, but praying for hours together. For our intimacy, for our maturity, for God's glory being revealed through us as a people. Because there is a dark world out there that needs not only hope, but light. And we are to be a city on a hill. Will you shine? Well, brothers and sisters, if you're in Christ, you already shine. Let us shine together. And if you're not in Christ this day, my call to you is to plead with God. To cry out to God. To be in the Word. To seek after Christ as much as you can. And that we would pray with you and for you that God would open your eyes to see. Will you believe on Christ this day? And tomorrow? And the next? And the next? That you might forever 
be counted worthy of His kingdom. Let's pray. We praise You, Father, for this Word. We praise You, Lord, for Your grace and Your mercy. We praise You, Lord, that we can understand and see Your glory in such a way that very few people can understand except they be born again. And so, Lord, as we close our time, let us not just leave for the sake of going, but Father, let us leave connected and full and pursuing glory by Your power and for Your name's sake. Father, I pray for our children today, Lord. I thank You, God, they're so attentive and they're listening. And I pray, Lord, that they would hear these words as they assume they learn language just by observation. Father, may they learn to hear Your Word in the same way. That You would save them. That we would be together forever eternally in heaven and in the new created world with Christ as our light. In Jesus' name we pray.